Hello, my beautiful friend, and welcome back to the Health Habits and Epic Living podcast. So I'm excited to be with you today, and today I want to dive into a topic that I think is really important. I had been asked a few weeks ago to give a presentation, and because I am a health and habits coach and people listen to my podcast, this group of women really wanted to learn some of the common myths around building a new habit. So I want to talk about the three common myths that I hear and that are believed out there in the world around building a new habit. Because I want you to know that these are false. I really want you to know that these really aren't true. Because I think when you start to buy into them, and you start believing they're true, somehow that information can block you from making progress. And so I will give examples about that as we go through each of these topics. And I really wanted to do this podcast at this time of the year because this is a time of year where many of us look to develop new habits. It's a time of year where kids go back to school, new routines start to fall into place, new schedules start to fall into place. We're coming off summer mode and we're going into fall mode. And so for a lot of people, they look to make more change, healthier change, healthier ways of being. They get recommitted to their goals, goals around, it could be losing weight, cutting back on the drinking. Maybe they overdid it in the summertime or fell off track or didn't prioritize it. And so now it's becoming more important for them. So I want you to listen in and see if you have any of these beliefs around what it takes to develop a habit, because I don't want any of these beliefs to really get in your way or to make you feel like a failure if you're believing them and they aren't working, right? So let's dive in. So I'll start with myth number one. And I believe that this is (laughs) pretty predominant out there. And the myth is that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. So this is bogus. This is false. But let's go back and see where this came from. And so if you look at the origin of where this 21 days it takes to build a habit, it comes from Dr. Maxwell Maltz's observations with his work in self-image. So he published a book long, long time ago. I'm holding it up if you're watching the YouTube video of this. This is his book, where it came from. And what he had said in this book is what he observed when working with his patients, that it generally takes about 21 days for someone's self-image to change. He said it this way, it takes a minimum of 21 days for somebody's self-image to change. And so when he said that, a lot of people took that and ran with it. So now you hear life coaches like Tony Robbins and others talking about how it takes 21 days to build a new habit. And that's not exactly what he said. And it's not based on research. It's just based on his observations back in the 1960s. And so since this book is widely popular, it's sold over 30 million copies, right? Some people misinterpret or misunderstand when he says it takes about 21 days minimum for people to start to adjust to a new self-image. And so people ran with that and say, oh, it takes 21 days to build a new habit. So that is not true. Now, we do have a small research study that's come out that talks about what it does take to build a new habit. And when I say a small study, I'm meaning 96 patients, 96 subjects were in this trial. And it looked at how long it took for somebody to build a new habit. So one small trial, right? One small study. And it looked, when the researchers studied the people, it looked like it took about two months to a little over two months to institute a new habit. And if it boiled down to exact amount of days, it was around 66 days. Okay, so this is one study. And the conclusion of this study is, yes, about two, two months, a little over two months or 66 days. However, it depends on the complexity of the habit. It depends on if we're moving away from a really addictive habit to a new habit, right? So There's a lot more involved than just number of days. And if you really look at the totality of research out there, it says it could take 
a minimum of 10 days all the way out to 200, 300 days to start a new habit. Again, it comes back to the complexity. It comes back to how motivated or how committed the uh, person is. And there are are many factors that are involved in what it takes to establish a new habit. So I think this is important to bring up, not just to be scientific about it or to say it takes a certain amount of time, but I think it really highlights that for some of us, if we take 30 days off of drinking, for instance, in my case, right, I do a sober January or sober October, dry January, sober October. And guess what? After that 30 days, I seriously was expecting that my habit would automatically change. And so when my drinking habit didn't change, and by February 2nd, I was drinking the same amount of Chardonnay and still wanting cocktails and still wanting to drink when I went out with my friends and still wanting to overdo it, I kind of felt like a bit of a failure. I kind of felt like, well, what did that prove come January? What did that do? I did this hard work of avoiding it and not having it for a whole month, and yet it didn't influence my drinking the next month. And so part of me is like, well, how long do I have to go without drinking to make it a habit that I just didn't want it or I wanted it much less? And so I wasn't necessarily hanging on to the 21 days, but I was hanging on to 30 days should change me. 30 days should change my relationship with alcohol. And I'll tell you why it didn't. I was focusing on the outside, the alcohol, right? Just not having it. What I wasn't doing, I wasn't doing the inner work that's required for transformation. When somebody says, I'm transformed, I just don't want it. I have a new relationship with dessert. I have a new relationship with alcohol. I have a new relationship with food. And they truly don't feel compelled strongly to indulge they've done the inner work. You cannot change behavior, your actions, without doing the inner work. I just haven't seen it be sustainable. So it does require to change something on the inside. And so what I was doing was just changing my behavior. I was changing my action. I was just telling myself, I don't get to have it this month, but I get to have it next month. So what did that do to my brain the whole month of January? It was building my anticipation for alcohol come February. It was saying I have to deprive myself now, and but I get to reward myself later. And I see women do this, like they stay so committed to their goals Monday through Friday, and then they reward themselves with the exact same thing that they're trying to avoid and change the relationship But it's only building up the urge, the craving, and it's only setting this substance up on a pedestal, whether that's weed, whether that's sugar, whether that's you've been restricting carbs and now you get to have your cheat day and so you go overboard and then you feel bloated and you feel terrible or you go overboard with alcohol and you wake up going, oh my God, that was so much fun, but oh, I feel like crap, right? So if we have this narrative Monday through Thursday that's different than the narrative Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I think we constantly battle ourselves. I don't think we are setting ourselves up for a committed, changed relationship with alcohol that's going to be permanent, a consistent, changed relationship with food that's going to be permanent, right? We are going to Continue this cycle of deprivation on these days, complete joy reward on these days, and it's going to be a constant battle because we have now a mixed message that we're giving our brain. And we're also saying we're a good person Monday through Thursday, but somehow we're not a good person Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I see this a lot. I see this really a lot is that. We are a good person when we do the thing that we want to be doing, and then we tell ourselves we're a bad person, or we fell off track, or we're not following what we want to be doing, right? All the ways we could be self-berating ourselves, even if it's mildly, 
I'll hear people say, oh, I don't really beat up on myself, but they really are. They really are. They're just not recognizing it. And it doesn't, maybe it doesn't sound like this harsh critic, which most women I work with, it's more of a harsh critic. Like you screwed up again. I can't believe you fell off the wagon. You were so committed that whole three or four weeks and now you blew it, right? Like I feel a lot of people have the harsher critic, but there are some people that it's more subtle. So I really want to dismantle that it's going to take 21 days. That's going to take a certain amount of time. Yes, it will take a certain amount of time, but the amount of time is uncertain. How ironic is that? If it's going to take a certain amount of time to create a new habit, but we don't know. It's uncertain how much time, right? Somebody could get this really, really quick, and somebody could get this a little bit more slowly. Either way, if you're working on it from an inner transformation, we know it has a greater likelihood of lasting. So I wanted to mention that it does take a bit of time. And for many people, it's going to take more time than the 30 days. So if you look at that one study that showed us, it takes a bit over two months to really start to ingrain a new habit. I really want you to take that seriously. And so knowing this research, right, while back, this is why I created Tone in 10 to be over two months. It's a 10-week program on purpose. Right. I could create a boot camp. I could create a challenge. I think a lot of people get motivated for challenges and I am not against them. I just really want to create containers for women to truly transform. That is my goal, role, passion, purpose of life is to really get women to transform from within. And that takes time, my friends. Yes, I do weekly challenges all the time. It's fun. It can motivate you. It can give something for the brain to focus on that seems inspiring, that seems motivating, that lights the brain up. Yes, I love to work with the brain and all the ways that we can ignite its energy. Fantastic. But what I'm really about is keeping that consistent, is maintaining that and creating really purposeful change. So when people go through Epic U, right, they realize their drinking is changing. They are changing the relationship they have with themselves so that they can transform the relationship they have with alcohol, right? Because alcohol is solving a pain. We've got to look at what that pain is, where it's giving us so much joy, and we really got to find some ways to have joy other than alcohol, if we want to change our relationship with alcohol, we got to change the pain. And so we want to do that because we know that by doing that, the cravings for alcohol go away. The sugar cravings can go away, right? So that need for that substance outside of us can go away. This is why Tone in 10 is over two months long, right? Because I want that sustainable change. I want this habit formation. And I love that in the program, there's accountability, right? There's self-accountability. I give many ways that you can be self-accountable for that's individualized to the woman in the program. And there's group also accountability. And then we have calls where we talk about what's working, what's not working, what could be tweaked. And it's really about building sustainable habits that work. I've seen my mom yo-yo diet. Up, down, up, down with her weight, up, down, hating the scale. Oh my gosh, celebrating when the scale goes down by a pound or two, right? Just this constant ping pong. And I just think that does us a disservice because we're not really understanding how food affects us, our relationship with food, right? We're letting this dictate our happiness. We're outsourcing it. And I think if we live in that kind of way, to me, it's a form of chains and being in prison because we get to determine our self-worth and how we feel about ourselves based on a number, on a scale. I don't want to do that. I want to empower myself to make better choices, make healthier choices, live in a healthier way that supports the BMI, that supports the weight I want to be, that supports what is health for me. 
Now, the number on the scale for me is not going to mean it's the number on the scale that is going to be most healthy for you. The number may be smaller. The number may be larger, right? We're built differently. We have different bone structures. We have different amounts of water. We have different height. We have different things going on with us. And so I think that's very important to take into accountability. Not all of us can get to a size zero, if that is even a goal for some people, right? And I think size zero for some people would look terrible and maybe deathly, right? Because you can't get to that level based on your bone structure and all the things. So I think it's very important that we look at these things and seeing, are we tying that to our self-worth? Are we tying that to our self-image? And is that a proper reflection of how we want to be operating and living in the world? Do I want to give the message out there that everybody should be the skinniest they should be? Absolutely not. The message I want to give is giving yourself the amount of health, being the healthiest version of yourself, which is different, my friend, than the skinniest version, right? Some skinny people don't even have enough muscle mass. Right? If you think about the frail 80-year-old lady in her nursing home who doesn't have enough muscle mass and muscle strength to get up and get off a commode or get off at a bed and always needs help. Like that to me is not a sign of optimal health. So really looking at what are the choices and are they aligned with the healthy ways we want to be. So the first myth is really about the amount of time that it takes. And so it's going to take some time and just embrace that. I think when you embrace it and don't fight it, it doesn't make the journey feel so arduous. It doesn't make the journey feel like you're fighting with yourself. You're embracing that it's going to take some time. You're like, yes, it's going to take time to change. And that's okay. It's what's required to get it done. And if it's a requirement to get it done, that's basically what you're signing up for when you say, yes, I want to get habit change. And so that's why. It's important to keep going. And I really think it's hard to keep going for a lot of people. And that's why having that community, that's why I think community is so important. That's why having coaching calls, having a support structure, I provide that in Epic U, I provide that in Tone in 10. Really important to have that community, to keep learning and growing together in an environment that's safe, where you can feel non judgment. You can come and just share your woes and what's going on or what's not working, and you're not judged for that. You're not judged for following behind. You're just saying, ah, here's what's not happening, and here's what I want to happen, and here's how to get there. I think it's a beautiful way to support one another is to have that like-minded community. And I'll tell you, out in the world, I don't find oftentimes when it comes to my health goals, like-minded people, right? I'm easier to connect with them when there's already groups that self-identify as saying, yes, we're about healthy habits in this group. I'm like, yes, that's where I want to be, right? I want to be around others who are leveling up, who are advocating for themselves to be a healthier version of themselves. Now, what I didn't mention is that Tone in 10, you can join at any time. I have changed that. I used to do just a launch of it and saying, yeah, now it's open. Now you can join us. Now I've restructured it because I feel people get inspiration to find their community at different times. And I don't want to not have it available for somebody who's ready to make change now. Maybe you've been listening to the podcast a while, or maybe you'll be listening to it and hear this episode and say, yeah, I'm ready to make healthier habits around taking care of my body, strengthening my body, slimming down my waistline, if that's a goal that you have getting rid of insulin resistance, becoming more insulin sensitive, becoming more metabolically flexible. I want you to have that opportunity. So we've redesigned the program where you can join at any time. I also know people use launching as a scarcity tactic, and that's just, that's just not how I want to operate. That just doesn't feel good for me. I just want people to come if they feel it's the place where they can learn, grow, and make change. And I think that should be available when you are ready. So you can join now Tone Antenna anytime. It will take you through the process 
handheld slowly too as well. So we're building small sustainable change. So it's not as overwhelming when you join. So please check out Tone in 10 if you are interested in joining us. We just had some ladies join the group. It's a lot of fun. I am working on some goals in there this time around that are different. The first time around, I was really working on building my upper body strength because my in-body scan had told me that my body composition was weakening in that area. It wasn't as strong as other areas in my body. So I really wanted to target on my weakest area. And now I'm just using more of Tone in 10 and focusing now the principles on shaping up where I really want to shape up, and that's my backside. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun that I'm using the tools in there and sharing my journey with the women. All right, so come join us if you'd like, and you can check that out on my website. And if you do sign up for Tone in 10, I do have a few boxes that I'm giving away. You can see them here on YouTube if you're looking. These beautiful boxes that for till I run out, you'll get a little gift box of many surprises in there. And some of them are great resources to stay healthy, to stay toned. You'll get my favorite drink that reduces sugar cravings in there and a few other goodies that I don't want to mention because I'd love for it to be a surprise. So as we can continue to ship those out to when you join and as long as supplies last. All right. So we covered myth one. Now on to myth two. Myth two is willpower is the only thing you need to get there. <laughs> I think a lot of us still think this way. Willpower is the only thing I need. And as we talked about on this podcast before, willpower is finite. Willpower is not there around the clock. Willpower gives out. And usually we have willpower in the morning. And what I find for most people, it's once they get home from dinner or it's that five o'clock to bedtime hour is when all the mistakes are made, as people like to say. It's like, I was so good all day long. I had a healthy breakfast, a healthy lunch, or I intermittent fasted, or I was following my protocol, and then I had the wine, or then I had dinner, and then I went to, into the pantry and had some snacks. So it's usually just the last part of the day. And what I love knowing about that is that if you know those four hours or five hours was where you struggle, you don't need much help the rest of the day, right? Out of the 24 hours, if you just nail those other hours, 19 of them, and you've just got five you got to deal with, great. Then we need to learn life tools and skills in those five hours. And so you don't have to do this work the rest of the time. You just have to focus on those five hours. And so it feels really doable when I'm working with women and they're like, oh, okay, gosh, that makes me feel like I don't have to think about this all day long. I could just do some of these tools right when I get home. And for a lot of women, it's stress. They're just like stress eating, they're emotionally eating, they're emotionally drinking, or they just want to numb out because the stress is so bad. And they just don't know what else to do. They're just really stuck. They're just like, I tried a lot of things and nothing seems to be working. So it's really nice to know where your hangups are. I want to tell you that's a great thing. A lot of us want to hang our head in shame. A lot of us want to say, oh, it's been going on for years. And it's not. It's joyous to know where you get stuck. It's exactly knowing, hey, here's the problem. And once we know the problem, once we have the diagnosis, it's so easy to treat. It takes more time if we don't know the diagnosis. It takes more investigating. It takes more digging in. It takes more awareness. And so willpower is not the only thing that you need. Many women need community. Many women need friends doing the same thing or a support circle around them because maybe it's a knowledge deficit that they have. Maybe it's not an information deficit that they have. Maybe it's an action deficit that they have. And it would just feel good if other people that they were surrounded with also had this deficit and talked about ways that they overcome it, right? Then you don't feel like it's just you. You feel like, oh, there are other people who get me. There are other people who struggle. And that kind of like lessens the burden. That kind of makes the struggle seem like it's not just you. 
right? And I think that's where the term misery loves company comes from because it's like, oh, this kind of feels nice that other people struggle in this fashion as well. And so when people think it's just sheer willpower to overcome any bad habit, I really want to put that myth to bed because it's wrong. It's really not true. It's not just about willpower. I have a podcast talking about how to increase your brain power, right? How to increase your own determination to conquer it is what you want to do. And sometimes that's not enough for people. Sometimes they need that community. Sometimes they need people who are in their tribe who are going to be looking out for them, who check in with them, who hold them accountable. And that's why I love the containers that I've created in Epic U and Tone in 10. These are safe containers where you can come get support if you need. What a lot of us tend to do is we tend to isolate when we go off track. We tend to disappear. We tend to not reach out for help. (laughs) And what I want to tell you, ladies, I'm throwing you a life raft. Here, grab it, right? Don't be drowning. Don't be swimming out there all by yourself. It's hard, right? Trying to keep afloat keep you know battling the waves like here's a life guard thing that i'm throwing at you a little inner tube let me help you i'm not saying i'm rescuing you i'm just saying let me help you let me help you lighten the load let others help you i know that sometimes it's a hard thing to ask for as women we think we have to do it all on our own we're oftentimes the social calendar for the whole household. We're keeping everything in check. We've got the kids' schedules. We've got the husband's schedules. We've got the lunches being made. we got the dinners. And we hate that question, what's for dinner, right? But we don't. We just suck it up and keep going. But oftentimes, we need love and support as well. And it's really nice to get that feminine energy from other women who live the same struggles. Not saying men aren't helpful. They are. They're just helpful in a different manner. So when it comes to what will get you there, there's a lot of things that will get you there that is other than willpower. I'm not poo-pooing willpower. It's lovely when it shows up, but we need social support. We need emotional support, determination. Sometimes people do well when they are accountable to others. For some people, that doesn't feel good. They don't want to be accountable to others. They just want to check in and have more self-accountability and say, hey, here's how I've been staying accountable. And that feels good. Sometimes for people, their environment needs to change. And if their environment changes, oh my gosh, they just up-level. They just sprout like a plant. It's like, whoa, I just needed to get a refresh. Or sometimes vacation does that for people. They get away for a week or two, have the best ideas and come back and just, boom, start flowering like a plant. It's lovely. So sometimes it does take an environment change. And we know that from the rat park studies that I've talked about in the past on this podcast, right? When a rat is by themselves in a cage and they're given morphine or drug-laced water versus water that's just plain, they're in alone, all alone, in a cage, by themselves, with no toys around, right? They're just going to continue to use the drug-laced water. They're going to continue to go to the morphine, right? Because it's they're going to develop an addiction and then they're going to die early because they're going to become addicted. But when you create rat park, when you create this massive cage, put other rats in there, you got males, you got females, you got hamster wheels or the wheels that they run on or whatever they're called. I guess they're called rat wheels (laughs) and they've got things to do. And they've got mating that can happen and they can make babies and they can flirt and they can hang out with other rats. And then you put the drug-induced water or pure water. Yeah, they tried both. The rats tried both. But what did they drink more of? Plain water. They didn't want the morphine-induced water. Why? Because life was so amazing. They didn't want to miss out. They don't want to be sedated, sleeping on the couch getting fat, not doing anything, right? just being lazy and sedentary. That wasn't fun. They wanted to go out and enjoy Rat Park. They wanted to meet the ladies. They wanted to hang out, right? It was fun. So environment, we learned from that, environment does make a difference. So if you're in an environment that's feeling stale, low energy, not supported, not growing, and you're ready to evolve and take off, but you just are kind of stuck by your environment, sometimes it really helps to change environment. 
Now, I didn't realize when I first started this podcast how much environment does make an impact. And that's something where I've changed my beliefs on over the years is looking at that research, understanding that research, digging in and hearing women talk about, oh, when I hang out with this person, it feels so good and I don't want to drink or I don't want to overeat and they don't overeat and it feels contagious to me. And I, I just really enjoy their company and I really feel fulfilled or I feel so connected that I don't even think about the alcohol. I don't even think about the extra cravings that I have for sugar or dessert. It just doesn't come up in those environments. So what is special about those environments? Like really dissect that for you. Really see where you flourish, where you grow, where you feel ignited, right? I just felt ignited recently in my life and mentioned it in one of my emails. The principal of my daughter's school gave this kind of Debbie Downer message, but he's like, I'm not giving this in a way that's Debbie Downer, right? Where our kids are less optimistic nowadays because they are surrounded by so much social media and the news. And what's in the news right now is, is not very positive. Um, and they're learning from us. And if we're talking all the time in a negative tone or overreacting in a way that's tense, they're going to pick up on that. And he goes, I'm given this message because I think there's opportunity. And I, my eyes just lit up. My heart lit up. My gut lit up. Everything was on fire in front. Like I was just like, I wanted just to keep applauding him. It was felt so powerful. I'm like, yes, this is where we're going wrong as a society. I agree. There's just so much goodness out there. And we can be helping our kids. And if we don't have kids, we can be helping others. Just how we show up in the world, just how we interact, what we talk about, what we fuel ourselves with, what's important to us, right? And so I thought that message was so amazing. It's like still with me. I'm still talking about it weeks later. It was so inspiring. And I don't know, not, not carrying around this inspirational energy all the time, but every time I reflect on that, the inspirational energy comes. And so I know that about myself. I know that about my brain. I know that it ignites my body. It ignites my spirit. I come alive differently knowing that. And so I'm keeping that message with me. It was so good. And so that environment, right, really changed a lot of things that I'm doing now because of it, right? In my business, in my personal life, like it's changed me. And that's what I want this podcast to do for you. Those are the containers I want to create for people. It's where we're making positive change and a big impact. So I don't want people to think it's just willpower only. Let me give another example. I was at an event here in San Diego and a woman, oh, we were just introducing each other and saying what we do. So a woman comes up to me afterwards and she says, oh, you're about healthier habits. I'm really trying to lose belly fat. And you mentioned that. I'm 63. I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing everything right. And I just can't move this belly fat. And I really want to. There's the stress I want to get in into. We're going on this vacation and I have just a few weeks to do it. And I said, well, let me help you. Let's see what we can do. So she didn't want a program. She just wanted my attention. So we did a consult call and we looked through her lab work. We looked through all the habits she was doing. And she was so amazing that she's like, I'm so committed. I don't need accountability. I just need you to tell me what to do. I'm just... So when we went through all the things that she was doing, first of all, we looked at her labs and there were some key things that were off. And I said, okay, this is telling me where to look in your habits because something is not aligning because these factors that you have are kind of alarming and leading to belly fat. So we're just targeting belly fat, right? That was that was the key that she couldn't zip up the dress because there's too much fabric. The zipper wasn't working because of the belly fat. So we just zeroed in. And in that consultation, we noticed that there were some things that she was eating that weren't a fit for her body. Now, she didn't know this because she believed the packaging. She would show me the packaging on our Zoom call. And she's like, look at the label. It says it reduces weight. It says it causes weight loss. So I said, the marketing is great. But if we look at the ingredients, there's xenoestrogens in here. There's obesogens in here. 
There are emulsifiers. There are things that are getting in the way, especially in your 60s, that are causing more estrogen dominance, which is going to cause more belly fat to occur. And so let's just take a week or two and take away these products that are processed and potentially causing belly fat for you. And so for her, it wasn't an action issue, right? She was running three to four days a week. She was resistance training. She had her exercise dialed in. She was doing all the things. She was eating all the bars, sucking down all the protein shakes, like all these things that she thought were leading to a healthy lifestyle. And so when I taught her how to read the label and how it matched up to her blood markers, right? Like what's going to be expected if you make these changes? She lost eight pounds. She was able to fit in her dress. She was able to go on her vacations and she felt amazing. And she said, nobody's ever talked to me like that. I went to my doctor. Nobody's ever connected all the dots for me. And then she had her blood work done and all those parameters that were kind of getting shaky, looking towards insulin resistance, they all started to come down in a short period of time. So for her, It wasn't that she needed accountability in terms of taking action. She was a pure action taker, highly successful, highly motivated. I mean, super motivated that she just kept talking and talking and talking, right? She's like, I really want this. So she didn't have a motivation problem, a willpower problem. For her, it was a knowledge problem. For her, she was believing in the marketing on these products. And of course, these products are going to market, right? They want to sell more of them. So they're going to tell you and make all these beautiful claims. And some of them, it may be true, but for her, where she was at, what her markers said, just that one call lost eight pounds. Amazing. Amazing. So it's not just willpower. Sometimes it is information, a lack of information. Sometimes it's a lack of action, right? There's more to developing healthier habits than just willpower. So I really wanted to highlight that as a myth, right? So don't be telling yourself you don't have enough willpower because maybe you do. But it takes more than willpower to build a healthy habit. All right, moving on to myth number three. This is something, I don't know. I used to think it was just for perfectionists, high achievers, highly successful people, what I would categorize this bucket. But I'm finding it's not just those people. So it's the all or nothing approach. I almost feel like it's ubiquitous, an all or nothing approach. That's myth number three. That when you start something, you have to go all in. Everything needs to change all at once. You need to make these massive changes all at once. And if you don't keep making these massive changes, you're not going to get results. So I'm going to pick on a program. Not because I don't believe it doesn't work. It does work. I've seen before and after photos. It can work, absolutely. But it won't work for everybody. So I know people like to do programs to lose weight. That's great. We want support. We want community. I'm all for that. I think finding the right tribe, finding your gals, finding whoever it is that motivates you, inspires you, whatever it is you buy into and want to do. And you want to be on that journey with somebody who feels fun or safe or whatever the attributes is that you're looking for. So some people really want to rock it out of the park, right? And so they may start off not being really good in this area, but then they choose a program where they're like, this program is going to transform me. And great, I hope it does. But there are some programs out there where it's like all or nothing, right? You got to go all in or somehow you have to start from the beginning. Those are programs that can seem like an all or nothing approach is the only way to get results. So one program I know of is 75 hard. If you looked at it, it's pretty intense, right? You've got to follow these checklist items every single day and you've got to follow it according to the way it's written. You can modify it, of course, but some people don't give themselves the modification, (laughs) right? They think I have to do the two exercises, read 10 pages, get the amount of water in, all of that to get the change. And it even says, if you don't do all the things, avoid alcohol, right? All the things, get your two workouts in. You have to start over the next day. 
And I think that's the part of it that bothers me the most, that you have to start over the next day. Because even if you got one workout in and had one glass of wine and maybe you didn't get all the water in, maybe that's better than where you were a week ago. But somehow you have to start over. And I think that's where I feel we learn if we're not perfect, if we're not following the plan to a T, we are a failure. We have to start over. We suck. Yeah, I was 93 days alcohol-free, but on the 94th, I caved, I binged, I got really drunk. I was laying in my own vomit, whatever it is, that somehow we suck, we have to start over. And nothing in those 93 days or whatever the number I was, I just threw out before that helped, right? It's not like I learned anything. I'm not a changed person. I'm just bad. I did this bad thing. And we just focus on how bad we are. We didn't focus on the positives, the changes we made, what we've learned in those 90 days. I hope whatever program is, they're teaching you about inner transformation, not just outer change in behavior or outer transformation. And so this all or nothing approach, I think really can set up people to give up, to think they suck, (laughs) to say, I broke my streak. I'm going to just throw in the towel for the rest of the year, the rest of the month, the rest of the week. I slipped up. And then you start hearing, I tried all the things and nothing works for me. Wow. Talk about ripping away somebody's hope. I tried all the things and nothing works for me. Nothing. I mean, that's like a hopeless state, right? Just to totally give up, to totally say, I'm out, not doing this. Right? That's when people are hopeless. And the best thing you can do for a person like that is listen to them and look for an opportunity to infuse some hope. What a lot of people hear is, no, you can do it. Go change. Let's change now. Right? Like it it goes from like 180, right? You're over here and you need to be over here. And that's not going to work for everybody. It's really tuning in to see what kind of change this person is ready for now, if they are ready for change. Sometimes they just want to be heard, right? So this all or nothing approach can be detrimental. That you, if you're not going all in, right? That somehow you won't make it. And I see books like Tiny Habits. I see small change over time leads to compounding interest. Right. If you make up a habit like in your early 20s and start putting away a chunk of change and that investment just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And then all of a sudden you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the bank or more. But it didn't require a big change. If you start walking and you start walking for 10 minutes, some women start there and they start walking and then all of a sudden they find a walking partner. And that makes it fun. And then they go for walks with their friends. And all of a sudden, those 10-minute walks become 30-minute walks. And all of a sudden, the friend is like, hey, I'm going to do a workout. Do you want to join me? And they're doing a workout together. And it's more than a walk. And then it's a walk and a workout. And so that small change begins to ignite momentum, begins to ignite in the brain, I can do this, begins to change the self-image the person has, the self-identity. And so I don't think it needs to be a big grand slam right out of the gate. It can't be, I'm sitting on the couch and now I'm doing 75 hard and crushing it. I see a lot of people get injury, injury prone, right? Because they weren't doing a lot of exercise before and now they're kind of doing too much for their bodies. Maybe an ease in phase before they're like totally able to do all the check boxes. I think little by little can work as well. So I'm not a big fan of the all or nothing approach. And I don't think it's just perfectionism. I think it's also programs out there that say it needs to be this way. It needs to look this way. And if you're not doing it this way, you're not somehow measuring up. So I think those three myths, we really need to start breaking. We really stop perpetuating that. Just like that time I told you when somebody had told me one more drink won't hurt, I never say that. And now when I hear people say that, I'm like, "Mm, I'm not sure if that's true. Like it might not be the context going onto my soapbox and saying, no, that's not true. 
I might say it more lightheartedly and just get them to think a little bit differently about the messages coming out of our mouth because why did we think it took 21 days to institute a new habit? Because so many people read the book and started saying this and then one person heard it (laughs) at an event and took it home and started telling others and started telling others and started telling others and now we just think it's truth. When if we go back to the place where it came from, that's not even what it said at all. (laughs) So I really think being mindful of the messaging we put out there to our kids, to others, to our friends, right? We don't want to perpetuate things that aren't true. And then we just ha 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 laugh it off because we want to speak truth. Truth is important. Truth sets us free. I love that. Truth sets us free. And when we are able to see the truth and stop walking in denial and stop pushing it away and stop pushing painful, emotional things away, and when we can embrace it, that's when change gets ignited. And I love that. So embracing a new identity is where change is going to start, right? And helping women find their new identity is super fun. So I'm going to have an upcoming podcast about really what it takes to institute a new habit. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in an upcoming podcast. And it really comes down to our choices, right? Making good, healthy choices. And sometimes I don't like to use good because we think of good as being moral. So when we say bad choices, somehow we interpret that as I'm bad. And it's not a moral thing. It's just a choosing. So I like to think of it as healthier ways and healthier habits, healthier choices. That's what it really comes down to. And we'll expand upon more of that, my friend, in an upcoming episode. So until then, continue to make your healthier choices and have healthier ways so you can live more epically. All right, my friend, great seeing you here, and I'll see you next time.